Hey guys, Turk here, hope you're having a good one. The Ryzen 7000 series is finally here, and overall, I've really enjoyed my transition to the new AM5 platform. However, as good as the results are within today's video, is it time for you to hop onto the 7700X for your new build or for a new upgrade? Let's get cracking. I originally had planned for this video to be a launch day review, and I wanted to include Modern Warfare 2's open beta results, including some of the latest Intel as well as AMD processors into the mix. But alas, my 7950X was dead on arrival. Fear not, I have managed to acquire a 7700X in order to complete my testing. So let's continue my obsession with eight core CPUs and see how AMD's latest 7700X manages to perform inside of my high performance gaming and production rig. Today, I'm gonna to be looking at three different processors. Of course, we're looking at the Ryzen 7 7700X from the AM5 platform, but we're also taking a look back at the old AM4 eight core processor, the 5800X. Of course, we have to look at an Intel part in order to get a good comparison, so I'm gonna be leveraging the Intel i7-12700K. Comparing the specs, I start to see a bit of a cross-generational vibe going on. AMD Zen 3 chips are still well received in the community, and the 5800X is no slouch, with eight cores boasting up to 4.7 gigahertz. Being the last generation on the AM4 socket, DDR4, 3200, and PCI Gen 4 are the mature foundation for most modern computers. Intel updates things a bit with their 12th generation core processors. The 12700K enjoys eight performance cores running two threads apiece and four additional single threaded efficiency cores. Boosting up to five gigahertz, the speed and extra cores stack it up to potentially best AMD's 5000 series. Intel adds support for both the stable DDR4 platform and also enables DDR5 for those looking for more longevity in their builds. In addition, PCI Gen 5 is also enabled, but as always, check your motherboard's manual for the connections and their rated speeds. Now the Ryzen 7 7700X updates their Ryzen 7 lineup with modern features while bumping up boost clock speeds to an impressive 5.4 gigahertz. As I said in my Zen 4 Gamescom announcement breakdown, it feels just really good to see AMD boosting as high as the competition, even at lower wattages. Along with the impressive clocks, AMD updates its motherboard platform with the AM5 socket, embracing DDR5 and PCI Gen 5 from day one. Unfortunately, that means no direct upgrades from older builds. However, there is CPU cooler compatibility between the AM4 and AM5 sockets, but we'll be touching on that towards the end of the video. For my testing today, both the 5800X and 12700K are going to be running in DDR4 mode, leveraging two 16 gigabyte sticks running at DDR4 3600. As with many of the reviews out on the internet, the Ryzen 7 7700X will be going with DDR5 at 6000. Of course, I would have loved to put the Intel part into a DDR5 based motherboard, but I spent all of my cash on that AOK -okay Zoe handheld. So guys, subscribe to the channel and help me persuade my wife that I should be able to pick up another motherboard for testing. My Intel system is using the ASUS Z690P Prime D4, and I'll be adhering to Intel's performance limits throughout the benchmarks. AM4 is covered by the MSI X570 Godlike, and the 7700X is running on the ASRock X670E Tai Chi. Let me know in the comments if you'd like me to review this puppy. As for the GPU, I'm gonna be pivoting away from some of the mainstream reviewers, and I'm going to leverage my Radeon RX 6950 XT. It's a bit faster than the 6900 XT, and it should be also faster than an RTX 3090. And guys, since the Ethereum bubble is finally burst, you can pick up a 6900 XT for right about $700. So the performance we're gonna see in today's video is quite obtainable compared to results with the 3090 Ti. With this GPU, we should be able to mitigate any GPU bottlenecks that we see in our testing. And as always, the detail settings and resolutions will be listed in the charts themselves. Check out the description below to see additional information about my test bench setup. 
Let's start with application performance, and I'm gonna be focusing more on rendering performance. Now, to make the charts a little bit easier to read, I've normalized all of my results against the 7700X. So if you're interested in the raw performance numbers, just head over to the Discord and let me know over in the Benchmarks channel. Cinebench is a staple in the benchmarking scene, and already the 7700X is off to a great start. With 10 minute long runs, the 12700K is 16 percentage points faster than the 7700X, thanks to the extra E cores. As for the 5800X, the newer chips increased IPC and clock speed make the older chip 24% slower. If we look at single core performance, I'm surprised that the 5 GHz limit of the 12700K gives a little bit of breathing room for the 7700X to take a decent sized lead. Luxmark renders things a bit differently, and we see a narrowing of the margins, with the Intel not being as fast and the 5800X performing slightly better. In POV Ray, we see similar performance levels to Luxmark, but that 7700X single core score is quite impressive. V-Ray closes us out with even more lead tightening with the Intel part in their multi-core score, though the 7700X is clearly a step up in performance to the older 8-core AMD part. Geekbench is an interesting benchmark today because it runs a lot of different tasks covering the entire set of the chip, while also running them pretty quickly in succession. With all the cores running, the Intel and 7700X are neck and neck, while the 5800X just can't keep up. Even with that single core score, the Intel chip gets hammered by the 7700X's clock speed. Y-Cruncher takes it to the next level, with the 12700K and 5800X taking 22 and 33 percentage points longer to calculate pi compared to the 7700X respectively. Overall, I would say that the 12700K is better at deterministic fixed duration workloads like handbrake, comp code compilation, and some of the stuff we saw within the Geekbench results themselves, but when it comes to shorter duration bursty workloads, the 7700X manages to come out on top more times than not. On to gaming. I've segmented each of my games into three different genres. I've got esports, cinematic games, and more action strategy types of games. For esports, I'm going to be leveraging my interviews that I conducted with actual esports professionals in their own esports titles, as well as leveraging the results we obtained when testing all of the different high-end hardware from Intel, AMD, and Nvidia. So the results you see are going to be very realistic when it comes to competitive esports titles. In Call of Duty Modern Warfare, we're dropping into Rebirth Island and making a mad dash from Headquarters Tower Roof to the second floor of Headquarters, then it's off to Grandmother's house we go. With any luck, we sprint between Prison and Headquarters and climb back to the roof. As the bullets fly across my path, the 7700X manages to land 21% faster than the 12700K and 17% faster than the 5800X. Though the gains are considerable, what's more critical is that we are nearly capping out a 240Hz monitor in the process. Or, better stated, our 1% lows do not drop below 144Hz. This might be the competitive edge to keep your opponent salty. In CSGO, we're re-rendering the 2018 grand files and seeing impressive average frame rates. However, the 7700X yet again manages to claim the 1% low prize able to cap out a 240Hz panel over 99% of the time. Last is Fortnite, where I'm running through a trio match and fragging some little kids. The 7700X gets another massive win compared to the 12700K, running 24 percentage points faster on average. The 5800X is no slouch either, besting the 12700K but still falling short of the 7700X. However, despite the results, each configuration is effectively the same gaming experience. Now let's slow things down just a little bit and enjoy the finer things in life. Cyberpunk 2077 only separates our contenders today by 15 FPS, but again, those 1% lows are mighty fine for the 7700X. Forza Horizon 5, on the other hand, highlights a massive performance improvement from the 5800X with a 31% improvement. The 12700K is only 31 FPS slower than the 7700X, but capping out a 240Hz panel during high-speed racing is undoubtedly an excellent experience. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is another benchmarking staple, and the 7700X pulls ahead by 12 and 15% faster, 
than the 5800X and 12700K respectively. Last up are our strategy and action games. As you know, when you're playing these games, there's a bunch of variety in the different missions, environments, and all that sort of thing, so I've benchmarked a handful of different options in order to give you guys a bit of more of a realistic approach to what you'll see in real gameplay. Dawn of War 3 shows a similar behavior as with Fortnite. However, we are far less susceptible to anything above our monitor's refresh rate in this game. Total War 3 surprisingly shows consistent results across all of the different samples today. Still, the 5800X only lags behind with less than stellar 1% lows. Last is Hitman 3's Dubai benchmark. The 7700X gains yet another win, speeding ahead by 24 percentage points compared to the older processor. And now for something completely different. As I was trying to debug my dead 7950X, I unfortunately wiped all of my memory timings from my motherboard when I was installing the one of many launch BIOSes onto my motherboard. So rather than get upset, let's make lemonade out of these lemons and see how DDR5 memory transfer rates impact our performance for the 7700X. With the applications I've tested, memory speeds only seem to impact applications that gobble up RAM, such as Y-Cruncher and likely code compilation tasks. However, I just don't have that benchmark data available just yet. What's more impressive is the gaming results. Counter-Strike, Total War 3, and Cyberpunk showed minimal improvement, but there were gains to be had with the faster kit. On the low end, we get a meager 4 percentage point improvement with Dawn of War 3, we see 9% improvement in Tomb Raider, 10% in Hitman 3, and 6 percentage points in Forza and Fortnite. Though not earth shattering, it does look to be pretty promising, and I'd love to investigate how DDR5 impacts Ryzen's performance in a bit more detail. Before we close, I do have some gripes with the Ryzen 7000 series and the AM5 platform. First is the CPU cooler compatibility. Yes, the AM4 mounting kit does technically fit. If you're using any coolers that were made in the last year or two and it mounts directly to the provided AMD backplate or those little black clips that you know the cooler hooks onto, those type of coolers should work just fine. But suppose your cooler requires a custom backplate, like some older AIOs, water blocks, or those big boy air coolers. In that case, you're going to need to check out your cooler's website to see if they have mounting kits available. How about that iGPU? Well, technically, the Ryzen 7000 series does include a GPU portion for basic video out, but as of this recording and in my testing, it's not working as advertised. On the spec sheet, it says that the compute unit should boost up to 2.2 gigahertz, but from what I'm seeing, it's not even getting up to between 4 and 800 megahertz. So as far as I can tell, two compute units of RDNA 2 in an iGPU configuration, it's going to run like utter garbage. Mendocino. <coughs> Last is the overall platform cost. Long gone are the days of inexpensive, enthusiast-grade motherboards. My ASUS Z690P Prime D4 runs at 200 bucks, while its DDR5 variant costs an additional $60 more. For AMD, the X670E version of that same ASUS board costs an astounding $360. Even this Tai Chi motherboard runs nearly double what its older X570 counterpart would cost. Fortunately, DDR5 prices have dropped considerably, considering they were about $500 at the beginning of January to about $230 at the time of this recording. Despite those savings, that same kit in a DDR4-based configuration, it's going to cost you about $100 less. Now let's put that into context. I have two nearly identical builds where I'm only replacing the processor, the memory, and the motherboard. Everything else is being held constant. For the 7700X build, you're looking at a 14% increase in platform costs compared to a 5800X 3D build. Factoring Hardware and Box's FPS figures, that's only a 7 percentage point improvement in frame rates. If you're hoping to swap over any hardware from your old build, like a GPU, your cooler, your case, that's only going to make the platform cost even worse for the AM5 setup. Now let's circle back to the question at the beginning of the video. Is it worth picking up the 7700X right now? As much as I love the performance that we've seen in all of our different charts, I do have some pretty clear recommendations for you guys. 
If you're already on the AM4 platform right now, it might be worth picking up the best AM4 processor that you can pick up from the Ryzen 5000 series. If you're looking for value, the 5600X is only going for about 200 bucks. The 5900X and 5950X are great choices if you need more application performance. But the better CPU for gaming would be the 5800X3D. This processor boasts 96 megabytes of L3 cache, which puts these eight core parts into hyperdrive in most games. And in some cases, it even beats the 7700X. Couple the performance and the lack of a need to upgrade your motherboard, your RAM, power supply, case, etc. That system is going to definitely last a few years. And if you have a Zen 3 CPU, its performance is going to be excellent for most users. If you're debating between picking up a 7700X and a 12700K, keep in mind that my results today are comparing DDR5 with AMD and DDR4 with Intel. If we are able to get up to DDR5 6400, Hardware on Box sees an average 10 percentage point improvement for the 12700K. Depending on when you're watching this and what parts are on sale, either option will get you extremely good frame rates, but the 12700K will be the best overall processor for applications. However, there is a better alternative. Lastly, if you're looking to buy an entire system and get the best gaming experiences possible, I would definitely hold off on Ryzen 7000 for now. Intel's 13th gen processors are due to launch at the end of October, and from the rumors that I've been seeing, they might be performing better than AMD across the board. Of course, we'll need to wait for reviews, but that would be the time to make the decision between going with Team Red or Team Blue. But wait, there's more. If you have the luxury to wait to build a new PC, I would wait a few more months until AMD launches their Ryzen 7000 series with Vcache. Just like the 5800X3D, a 7800X3D, or whatever it'll be called, will most definitely be a screamer of a processor and will dominate many of the benchmarks we've seen today. So take the next six months to save up an entire build worth of money and build yourself a solid next generation build with DDR5, RDNA 3, or RTX 4000, and a Ryzen 7000 series processor. Bottom line, it's very difficult to recommend the Ryzen 7000 series right now. We're just two weeks away from the Intel 13th gen launch, and for most people, Ryzen 5000 series is going to be perfectly acceptable from average users all the way to high-end enthusiasts. Until AM5 platform costs get cut considerably or the X3D chips finally hit the market, it's going to take a significant price cut on the Ryzen 7000 series for them to remain competitive with both the 12th gen and 13th gen Intel parts.